笑了。Welcome to the Doctor's Companion presents Doctor Who: The Long Way Around, the weekly podcast we review, discuss, and recap every episode of Doctor Who, one Doctor at a time. I'm Scott Corelli, and I'm Cassandra Fredrickson, and I'm Nick Jimenez. And joining us today from the Ford Cast, the Harrison Ford Podcast, uh, comes Laura Milberger and Rachel Leishman. Welcome. Hello. Nice to be here. Hello. Uh, so, uh, today on the show, we will be discussing The Beast Below, which is the 11th Doctor's second story. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, Lauren, I'll start with you. What's your Doctor Who origin story? Well, I kind of come into Doctor Who actually through Sherlock, oddly enough, or maybe not oddly okay. enough. Um, but I became a fan of Sherlock, and then I had a new roommate um, who was a friend of mine, but I didn't know about Doctor Who, which I don't quite understand why I didn't, being a big time travel nerd. Uh, and she said, oh, there's this show on Saturdays that I watch, and I get the TV then, and, you know, it's just sort of my thing. And she started talking about it, and I was like, oh, it's that's time travel with the scarf, the guy? Yeah, I knew about that. Had I not knew about this show? So then she sort of sat me down and kind of eased me into it and showed me Blink and the, uh, the girl in the fireplace and sort of eased me into it. And then it hit right up to when um, The Impossible Astronaut was airing. So Mm -hmm. I got to watch this special that sort of updated me on everything that I missed, including River Song, which actually is one of the big things that got me into the show. And by the time I saw The Impossible Astronaut, it it felt like I had been watching the show for a while, even though looking back, I realized that was really my first real full episode of Doctor Who, and I just became obsessed. (laughs) Fair enough. What about you, Rachel? Um, so mine is kind of funny. So I had like seen pictures of like David Tennant as the doctor and everything on Tumblr. And one Christmas, my weird aunt gave my brother this long scarf that had like a Steelers logo on it. And so she handed it to him and I made some offhanded comment. Like, what does she think you are for? And he like turned to me and he goes, you know who the fourth doctor is? And I was like, I mean, I've like seen stuff on Tumblr. He goes, so you haven't seen an episode? And I was like, not really. No. And so he goes, fine. And he like, I went home that night and I had every DVD of seasons one through three burned for me and like (laughs) handed to me. And it was like, here, watch these. And so um, I started with nine and just went through and then became obsessed. And like every other girl was like so upset when they said David Tennant was leaving. And I was like, this guy doesn't have eyebrows. What is this? <laughs> and then my brother and I, for my graduation from high school, my mom took us to London because it's like my favorite place in the world. And so she, um, we ran from the hotel. My mom was like, why are we going to the hotel? We ran to the hotel from the airport. And she's like, why are we doing this? My brother goes, we're watching the premiere of a new doctor in London. Like, this is a big deal. And so we... <laughs> Awesome. ran and watched the 11th hour and he was like Rachel you're gonna love him and I was like no I won't sure enough like it got to the beast below and I was like I hate that this is like I like him and then Vincent and the doctor like confirmed that it was my favorite doctor and mm-hmm. that episode made me actually major in performance theater rather than English because it made I like from that point on was like I want to be a companion <laughs> and so like I have a Geronimo tattoo like it like became like 11 was like my favorite thing in the world. So you have a Geronimo tattoo and this is the, uh, this is, this is a big episode for that uh, particular catchphrase. It is. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's funny. Cause I'm looking at, I have a painting my friend made me in high school where it's me and a t-shirt that says I'm a wizard, which is like a joke from high school, but where I, so she said, I'd be the companion who would think I had magical powers, even though I didn't. 
<laughs> and so she painted me as the eleventh doctor's companion. And so I have that just in my room. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um all right, very cool. So uh so now we're uh all caught up on uh where you guys come from with the show. Uh let's talk about the beast below. So first, before we actually talk about the episode itself, just a couple of background things. Uh I always find it interesting the way that Doctor Who is shot because it's shot very much out of order cuz they just sort of block schedule uh episodes with directors. And so while the beast below was the second episode, mm-hmm. it was written and produced like fifth or sixth. Um after like Time of Angels, Flesh and Stone, after Eleventh Hour, mm-hmm. Moffat had already written Time of Angels, Flesh and Stone before he even started thinking of what the idea for the second story was going to be. And the only thing that he knew was that he wanted it to be a story in which Amy saved the day um, to sort of like earn her place as a companion. Uh, and then we ended up with uh, with the Beast Below. But also interesting is that it's directed by Andrew Gunn who directed Victory of the Daleks, um, which he actually directed prior to this, because they, for some reason, they shot Victory of the Daleks before Beast Below. Uh, Probably something to do with um, set design or something. More complex sets on Beast Below than on Victory of the Daleks. But uh, because of the way that it was shot and because it was written so last minute, there was a lot of script changes that... Uh, needed to be done, needed to be shot after the initial production. And so Andrew Gunn wasn't available for those reshoots. So actually, Euros Lynn shot like four scenes in this episode. Nice. Um, uncredited. OG uh, Euros Lynn, who we talked about in detail last week with Billy. Right. And, uh, and also, he hadn't worked on the show since uh, end of time. Uh, you know, the, the final David Tennant story. And the, um, for Lauren and Rachel, speaking of Euros Lynn, uh, we learned last week that he's also directed several episodes of Sherlock. Yeah. This season, nice. I think. Or the yeah. newest season that's coming yeah. out. Right. Oh, cool. Oh, that yeah. doesn't surprise uh, me. I think he, I think he's the, he's the director who did two this season. Cause there's always like a director who does two of the episodes. And then there's one person who just directs one of the random ones. Well, I hope, I, I, I hope uh, this will be the first season where the second episode is good. Yeah. <laughs> I hope, I, I think it's, I think I'm pretty sure this season is actually Euros Lynn and Rachel Talali are oh, the two directors shoot. on Sherlock. Yeah. They got Talali back. Yeah, they got, well, no, they got Talali for the first time on Sherlock. Oh, that's right. She's never, that's crazy to me that it's taken this long to get Talali to direct the Sherlock. Yeah. Um, oh, that's gonna be but dope. yeah, I know, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, so that's, that's basically, um, that's the background on that. Uh, the other thing is the actress who plays Liz 10, uh, Sophie Akinito or Akinito. Yeah. She, uh, what's interesting about her is when she was cast as Liz 10, it's actually not the first time that she had been on Dr. Who. Nope. She was actually the companion, Alison Cheney. In the Scream of the Shalka, like fake out Ninth Doctor animated thing, where Richard Grant <laughs> was the Ninth Doctor, uh, and that was back in 2003, before BBC decided to bring back the show. The idea was that the animated show was going to bring back the show as like an animated series, and it was popular enough that they were like, you know. Maybe let's just do it live action again. Um, and so poor Richard E. Grant uh, got stuck being whatever it is he is in uh, The Snowmen. The Great and, Intelligence, Scott. Yeah. Well, <laughs> is he The Great Intelligence or is he something else? I, that, uh, I have no idea. That's yeah, because The Great Intelligence was – wasn't wasn't The Great Intelligence um, no, I thought- uh, Gandalf, right? Well, yeah, he was the voice. Or of, not, no, not Gandalf. Uh, wait, no, yeah, Gandalf. No, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, it, it was Ian yeah. McKellen. Ian McKellen. The, yeah, Ian McKellen. <laughs> yeah. No, I think. Yeah, no. I think he's the assistant to the Great Intelligence. He's, right. Yeah. He's like the sure. guy who helps him out because he's not an actual body. Well, right. yeah. He's I mean, I mean, up, you know, Scott who, over, right? Yeah. I mean, if someone asks you who does Tom Cavanaugh play in the Flash, you you kind of say Harrison Wells. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, some people do. Some people. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, so, yeah. That's uh, that's that's pretty much it um, as far as uh, background goes. Uh, so let's get into it. Yeah. First off, 
I want to talk about who okay so so you're building you're building a ship <laughs> yeah. to escape the planet earth <laughs> and the first thing that you do is take the time to paint the union jack on the side of it i well, mean that thing's giant it's, it's the union jack it's sort of <laughs> it, it almost it almost seems a little too it, it seems a little too american like, it kind of does it seems like something bit. we would do that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, like, isn't, oh, we're running isn't, away, but hold on. Let's put our flag on it first. Yeah, but pride, it's right? You say that, though. Isn't this around the time where people were saying, oh, Doctor Who is trying to, you know, be too American and appeal to Americans more? Or was that more like the, the sixth season? That was more like Pennant. Um, I don't. I don't think any of it did. No. I'm saying, but there people were. There was like a backlash because it started showing on BBC America. That's just. It's just interesting. I don't think that's why it was there. I think that's a visual cue to be like, this is British. Right. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I. But I, I think you're. I think you're right. Well. I. But I wonder though if that isn't the reason why it's there. Is like it's reminding you that it's British because they know American audiences are watching it regularly for the first time ever. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's you know, they and they're like the Britain. opening, right? They added that sort of opening where Amy explains, which yeah. when you watch it on a loop is a, not a loop. When you binge it is a little frustrating, but that sort of opening that where she explains who she is yeah. and how she travels with the doctor. Oh so. yeah. That weird kind of like Fox kid style yeah. like intro that they used which to do. Only in the U S right. is my understanding. Right. Even the even the weird it was the weird VO when she's hanging out the side of the TARDIS was that always there or is that just in America? I couldn't remember. I don't. It's I'm not, just in America. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. Like, I'm at, just I'm in the BBC America. America it, it, it felt is odd. It felt like because I I remember watching them uh, illegally um, and <laughs> <laughs> and that I remember that being there though. So oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe it was. Did you watch um, it legally like after it aired in England? Yeah. Or like after it aired yeah. in America? Yeah, because it, it aired <laughs> first in England, so I'd wait like three hours and then I'd be this like, okay, it's Doctor Who time. You know, I mean, this <laughs> is before the uh, the current like kind of uh, alkaline days where they air almost simultaneously. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, great. Yeah, that, yeah I, I watched this after the fact, so I had already seen half of season six when I watched this, which I think also changed my perspective. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really like, uh, well, okay. So, so, uh, Rachel, London is your favorite place on the planet. Do they call these things boroughs like they do in New York or is it something else? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Cause, cause I, all these like London, I mean, I, for lack of a better word, because I don't know what exactly you call them, but the London, the idea that the London boroughs are high rises. I'm just really into that idea as like a. A future thing. Yeah. I, you well, know, I mean, we I, all know of our opinion of Doctor Who and high rises, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> it's true for <laughs> it. For it. Um, well, yeah. Speak- so, I, oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was saying. Um, speaking of the fact that it is a ship in its levels, I I thought it was really interesting rewatching it. Uh, sort of the off joke that Scotland has its own ship. But, uh-huh. now, but now with the whole, you know, referendum, and now with the EU, and they're saying, well, now Scotland's <laughs> going to leave. It seems. Uh, really timely, and it, it had a whole different resonance for me as opposed to oh, it's a little Moffat joke that he he's added in about yeah. the Scottish. But oh, wait, that might actually be what's happening right now. Well, well and what's really funny about it is uh, is you know he has he has uh, uh, Karen Gillan even say like Amy goes oh nothing nothing ever changes with, yeah. with Scotland. And it's like yeah. yeah, I guess I guess it really doesn't. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's actually going to be a sequel to The Beast Below where they jettison a bunch of. Uh, of the people in the Syrian ship <laughs> off of the, the Starship oh, no. UK. <laughs> uh, so one of my one of my favorite things about this episode is, and I'll get to one of the reasons why it has such a, uh, a big spot in my heart. But like one thing that I really like this, as far as like a design standpoint, is that this is an Earth rescue ship. Like it's it's where everyone is going as they're traveling across the stars to escape Earth being destroyed. And so there's not a lot of room for industry. I imagine like most of the things that people make are things like food and, uh, you know, things that like fix the ship in one way or another. But there's not a lot of new stuff. And so I like that everything looks like it's antiques. Everything is antiques on the ship. Um, Even like the desks that these students are at 
at the beginning uh is they're just they're antiques yeah i'm a big fan of i mean i i i love i just love the the look of the moffat era uh not i mean the content we'll get into it but like i i just really love how he turns it into like a fantasy show and everything does sort of look i mean like you you can almost picture like sweeney todd walking through like these streets and Mm -hmm. i i just really i mean i'm all about the juxtaposition of like old and futuristic and um, I agree. There, there's this kind of great throwaway line throwaway line where Matt Smith is like oh yeah everyone just kind of goes back to basics uh, mm-hmm. and I'm into it aesthetically mm-hmm. a lot really well, there's good. something very timely I... about that too adding the old and the new together it, it doesn't center it in a certain specific error where I think there's a uh, certain episodes or times of Doctor Who where you can watch it and even though they're in the past or they're in space you can go oh well that's the 80s Oh, well, that's the 70s. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you sort of mix the old and the new together, it makes it a little timeless, I think, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so I'm going to make a little confession. So I have seen The Beast Below, I mean, probably a dozen times. It's it's one of my like favorite go-to ones. We keep talking about how uh, our last few episodes, like End of the World and New Earth, for me, are like kind of comfort episodes because they're just so uh, – like just definitively Doctor Who for me. They're kind of standalone. Yeah. And Beast Below is definitely one of those for me as well. Uh, So I have seen this probably a dozen times. It has taken me until just this time to understand that this, this kid, his punishment was that he was supposed to walk home and instead he doesn't listen and takes an elevator anyway. And that's why he gets sent to the to the beast below. What did you think happened to him? I don't know. I was I didn't under I guess I just didn't understand what was what was happening or I actually didn't understand. I didn't understand. I, I, yeah. But I had it was seen just it this in a time. long time. I had yeah. seen it. I, I saw it once. I I have to confess that I didn't enjoy it the first time. The second time that I watched it, I loved it. And then I watched Y'all it the third time before. Excuses. It is Clear as day that that little boy was supposed to no, walk home and just get <laughs> <Very back. clear. laughs> But for some reason, I also did not catch until this, I watched it the, the second time going, oh, oh, I get it. He's supposed to literally walk down the stairs and not take the elevator. Yeah. That's what they tell him. <laughs> I know, lazy. I know. I don't know why I didn't catch that. I'm usually pretty sharp. <laughs> I, think it's, I, I think it's probably because they never show the stairs and I don't know how this place works. That's and so... True. You know, so it was just, it's a lot, it's a lot of world building that's being shoved into my head in the first 30 <laughs> seconds of this, Which of this is episode. Moffat is usually very yeah, good about, yeah. and that's something, watching this again, because I had not revisited the 11th Doctor, even though he's my favorite and he's my first Doctor. I just had it in a while, maybe I thought I'd miss him too much, but I hadn't really gone back, and I was sort of reminded, particularly at the beginning, of how much I enjoy a story where you are sort of thrown in, and Moffat's very good mm-hmm. at that, at being okay, well, you're in the same situation as um, the doctor is, and then you're going to get information as a human being would in this situation. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, and having watched this a dozen times, I, I still, even after a dozen times, I cannot tell you what the point of the Smilers are. I don't know what their purpose is in the story. They're watching I don't. Them. Is that is that it? Is yeah, that all? They're, they're just the surveillance. They're the yeah. cameras. They're yeah, watching every car- And they're they're carnival. Oh. They're, they're based on sort of carnival uh, games, is my understanding as well, which is a little creepy. I mean, anything that looks like a clown. Yeah, they definitely they they remind you of the thing from Big. Yeah, um, which I think they're yeah. supposed Zoltar. to be the like, yeah. Zolt, yeah, Zoltar. Yeah. <laughs> Zoltar. Listen, I got you on any pop culture <laughs> references you need. <laughs> um. So, yeah, I, I find it interesting, like, we just, th- you know, there are four, in this round of episodes that we've covered, this is the fourth episode that has dealt with this same sort of storyline of, yeah, this same event of the Earth being destroyed and uh, humans getting into a spaceship and escaping Earth. Uh, and I find that, I, I, I find it interesting that, the second story of four different doctors follows this same arc uh, because we have the fourth doctor with the arc in space. That's what that's about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have uh, end of the end of the world, new earth. And then this one, 
uh, and they're all following sort of the same event, uh, which I from different time periods, um, obviously, because this is, I think, earlier or later in the episode when they give uh, Amy's age of thirteen hundred and six. Um, I I just added I added uh, I I think her age is like twenty. What did we figure out it was in that one? Twenty one. Yeah. Twenty one. Twenty two. Yeah, she's like yeah. So so say she's. I mean, we'll just say she's twenty for the sake of my brain and math. <laughs> um, Round it off. Yeah. So so at thirteen oh six. Uh, add 2010, that means we're in the year 3,316, so minus 20, so yeah. 3,000, so 32, 90, 96. 96, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Nice. So much, much, much earlier than the year 5 billion on right. New Earth. Yeah. Right. Assuming that they're using the same uh, calendar years. I don't yeah. know. Actually, but. we could probably safely assume that they're not. <laughs> probably. <laughs> But uh, this is much earlier than the other ones, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I find that interesting. <laughs> it's I don't really know. Cool if at one point when they're like just walking through the the uh, the, the 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 streets at first, if you just see like the face of Bo just kind of chilling again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I always find it interesting that uh, I mean Moffat played around with this, obviously with like River Song and. I'm sure he's done it other times, but uh, for the most part in Doctor Who, it's interesting that when you see a character die, the Doctor tends to not ever run into them again, as if he's not a time traveler. Yeah. <laughs> Which is always something that's been weird <laughs> to me. Uh, Rivers, I mean, and obviously was probably weird for Moffat, which is why he created River, um, to... Uh, sure, uh, yeah. Do something differently with that, but... That would be um, really weird if just all of a sudden just like... The engineer that gets murdered in New Earth is just there. Yeah. <laughs> like, Whoa, right, hey. Exactly. Well, I, I Hello. It's you. I keep hoping that the, what was it? Oh, what's her first name? But Bucket from um, Good Man Goes to War. Uh, oh, no, I just butchered the title. Anyway, um, when, uh, when, the, when she dies and she talks about running in the forest with the doctor and he kind of he lies and says that he remembers, I was always thinking she was oh, going to yeah. come back. That that was going to happen, and then he was going to relive it later, but it hasn't. I keep hoping that maybe it will. Well, we still have one more season of, of Moffat, so it's very uh, very possible that he could he could do that. Because um, one thing that I I actually uh, picked up on is later when Amy is uh, again when when she's getting her age, and then it says marriage status, and she's like, ah, oh, and it says unknown. She's like, well, damn it. Um, when that, when that happens, I was like, what was, I'm, I, and I'm just like thinking well, back on flux, everything. Right? Time's in flux. That's what I, that's how I took that. That time's in flux. She hasn't made a choice yet. She's traveling with the doctor. And so they don't know. That's how I took it. Did they well, ever have time to like get their wedding licensed? Well, <laughs> well, yeah, but if you remember, they also got divorced that's at true. one point. They did get divorced and then. You know, I don't remember well, she them sign getting the papers. Doesn't she, doesn't he not sign the papers yet? Oh, I don't remember. I feel like they've I don't officially remember. become divorced. It's dumb. That whole thing. It's dumb. Is why it, <laughs> the yeah. whole thing was dumb. But uh, I thought maybe I thought maybe he that was like in reference to that, and he was like, "Oh, I did that thing, and so I guess I should have them get divorced well, and well, not remarried or and something." So, okay, I don't so, know. so we can just we can just go into this. I mean, I guess we don't have to worry about spoilers because the nature of the show. But like, yeah. When it's she, also like yeah, and like six years old. when when she when she dies in the twentieth century, her grave is labeled Amelia Pond, right? No, uh, Williams. Oh, and Amelia Williams. Williams. Okay. No, well, was it Amelia Williams or was it Amelia Pond hyphen Williams? No, okay. I think it was Williams. I think it was Williams. That was a big deal I, it, that it wasn't it says, Pond. No, oh. it says Williams. Yeah. Okay. I remember that being okay, a big so, deal. Okay, so googling it. It says okay, so so that I guess that's why she isn't even or Rory older. Arthur Williams and his loving wife Amelia Williams. But if time mm -hmm. is in flux and time can be rewritten, can one assume that that has not that's not her future yet? Because they do know how old she is, and well, I guess no, they could right. just find out the year that she was born. She could have disappeared. Right. Yeah, they could. Just, they're just probably guessing by the year that they know that she was born. They don't yeah. have to know her, how, when she died. 
It's like, for some reason, you were born in 1987 and you died in 1932. Wait, guys, guys, she was never married in this universe because everything folds in on itself and everything and the paradox opens and Pandora. Big Bang or Pandora open Big Bang thing. So, so the Big Bang thing. Yeah, so I, right. Yeah, exactly. That could be it too. Okay, that yeah. So that could be part of it. That's why there's no record of I mean, it yet. gets like a race from history or something. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he, gets, they, he literally ties like 27 times this season. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Roy Williams has died more than any faux celebrity <laughs> death. He's the Kenny. Like, it's just Roy Williams. He's the Kenny yeah. of Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> of the many things that Mo- – Moffat has a lot of tropes as a writer, but I think my yes. favorite one of his with – uh, Doctor Who is the idea of the Doctor having rules that he immediately breaks. Um, I think oh, that's yeah. my favorite. Of his. Here's, here's because- something that actually hit me. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, go ahead. Um, and this is just me sort of, I like to play devil's advocate some, sometimes and think of different thoughts. But watching it this uh, third time before we had this, I started thinking, is he testing her? I mean, he definitely has times where he breaks his own rules, but it seems almost like this is their first adventure together and he's testing her to see if he's, she is one of him, that she is someone who will care about people. Mm. I don't know. I'm not sure if I believe it or not, but it was something I thought, huh, is he, is he actually like breaking his own rules or is he lying mm. to her? Cause again, rule number one, the doctor lies. I, to me, I think he, he lies. Um, the <laughs> thing about 11 and I've said this time and time again is that he's a little kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He um what he does is like everything that happens, he reacts and then instead of apologizing, he just backtracks and pretends it's fine. So I think mm-hmm. like the whole episode and everything that happens and when he's screaming at Amy at the end and everything that ends up going wrong in this episode is just showing you exactly how the doctor is going to react in situations because up until this point you haven't seen that. Like it was just True. Um, the 11th hour was easing you into like, oh, well, now we're transitioning. There's a new doctor. But it wasn't ever really – it showed you the fun side of 11. But this episode is the episode that's showing you like, no, he's kind of twisted and dark and he will flip out on people and he says things and he regrets them. And, but he doesn't apologize. He just pretends nothing happened. Mm-hmm. So I think it was more that. Like it was more setting you up for what 11 was going to be like. Yeah, I mean, I that's that's I mean, my my thing with with Moffat generally is that he knows Doctor Who backwards and forwards, and so just in general, um, even before he became showrunner, and so I think he likes to play with the uh, with with all of those rules. Like he likes playing with the the trope in Doctor Who that companions never listen to the Doctor, so he plays with that a lot, and he likes the idea of like, yeah, the Doctor constantly saying. Oh, I don't, I don't mess with things. I don't mess with time. I don't get involved. And then he just constantly gets involved um, because that's – there would be no show otherwise. Uh, and so I and like that he, he kind of – he kind of like makes – pokes fun at the doctor a little uh, when he does stuff like conflict. that. That's also conflict too. He's, he, the doctor has a conflict within his own self as well mm-hmm. as within the environment and that, that makes really good story. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, I mean, the eleventh doctor. Oh, so, sorry. oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. no, I was going to say um, one of the other reasons why the eleventh doctor is my favorite is that based on the storylines that Moffat gave him, and I am coming through this as a Moffat fan through Sherlock, obviously, is is what he's given to chew on is that he he has a lot of internal conflicts, not that Tennant didn't, but that are obstacles that are put in front of him and the way that he is sort of forced to deal with it. And I think that Matt Smith was very lucky that he got a lot of really great scenes and emotional scenes as well as comic scenes to chew on. Um, I think I'm digressing a little bit, but it's, there's something about the 11th doctor that keeps having to come across this and, mm-hmm. and almost doesn't even go through. I mean, he changes, but you see a lot of the issues that watching this again, that Capaldi is just now sort of dealing with as a character. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so I would say what is probably the most memorable part of this for me is uh, I'm I'm a sucker for alien markets, <laughs> alien marketplaces. <laughs> And uh, I so so every time Doctor Who shows up in an alien marketplace, I'm I'm just I'm so on board. Um, and uh, so that whole section where they're walking down, and it's just such a little. It's a small space. It's not like a. It's not like a really like massive area or anything. Uh, but I just I love, I love seeing alien life. Uh, in that sort of way. And I mean, obviously, they're all human, but we well, are happy to see that capitalism survives through time and space. God. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because as you know, <laughs> such a Which seems to be a, a second episode uh, thing. I realized that, that Clara also goes through a market in her sort of first adventure after the first episode where she goes off, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, the Rings of Akaten. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this Very this underrated game. episode, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I think it has its moments. <laughs> The Rings of Akatan makes me cry every single time I watch it. <laughs> the monologue. I that like is that one. one of the best monologues oh. that Matt Smith has ever. It's just, it's so emotional. Oh, I love it. Um, mm-hmm. No, the marketplace, though, I that made me think of, like, you said earlier, it's a big quote for Geronimo, but it's not Geronimo. It's the gotcha quote that happens in The Beast Below. I what? thought, doesn't he say, uh, doesn't he say... Geronimo. Geronimo. Yeah, yeah. But like the one yeah. that everyone remembers from this one though is when at the very end, when him and Amy are standing, and that's when the gotcha thing started. Oh. Okay. I have to say I was surprised that it, it was so early on when I was watching Oh, this is the first episode he says Geronimo. Okay. I forgot about now that you said that I was like, I forgot he he screams it when he's Yeah. When he's about to be vomited up. Yeah. <laughs> And he also uh, and he also says it when he's crashing at the very end of uh, the end of the world, or no, at the uh, uh, end, oh, end, oh, end, of end of time. Oh, never mind. Yeah, yeah, he does. This is the yeah. second time. Okay, I guess I'm. Right. I'm, I'm is it, so, this is oh. when they were trying to make Geronimo happen, and then it kind of didn't really take off. Like oh, it, it was really, oh, it, it was great for the fifth. It was great for the fifth season, but then after that, I don't think he really said – it doesn't become like his catchphrase, well, really. Well, Moffat actually addressed that at the New York premiere of oh. Capaldi because I got really mad because I have a Geronimo tattoo and I was sitting in the audience and someone said, so what's Capaldi's catchphrase going to be? And they said, we have Fantastic, Alon Z, and Geronimo. And he goes, why well, didn't – we never said Geronimo was catchphrase. Like, Eleven didn't have one. And I was sitting in the audience like, oh, really? <laughs> you know, like, and I was like, I getting, getting ready to fight. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm getting ready to fight Moffat. That's so weird. <laughs> I, I don't remember him saying that. But, so they didn't consider um, it a catchphrase for him. They just, it was something he said. And I guess gotcha was also like, that's a bit, fish, fingers and custard, obviously, but then, like, the gotcha was something that kind of faded out, even and though it was, fans, like, a big deal. Quote. Yeah. The yeah. Fans, yeah, yeah, like, bow ties are cool. Eleven was more like, I'm going to have catchphrases and then just drop them. Yeah, I See, feel like the R cool is his catchphrase. Yeah. The, the, yeah. This, this, this weird object is cool, because I am I have it, so I'm cool, oh, and this yeah. thing is cool. That, that seems to be his general catchphrase. Um, but... I don't know. He just has quirks. I don't know that he has like a catchphrase, really. <laughs> he's just quirky. He's, yeah, he's just very quirky. He's like he's the Zoe De Chanel of the doctors. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's funny that he said that because I would consider Geronimo and you know the cool lines sort of his catchphrases. I mean, he, he Geronimo happens in the Big Bang, um, whereas Capaldi has none. Absolutely none, and maybe it's in comparison. Said but that's that he said. I, I guess "shut up" yeah. would be his. <laughs> shut up! Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, uh, stupid. Put, yeah, putting, putting heads right. Does he say that a couple times? Yeah. <laughs> but, he, but he also doesn't have a very. Yeah, the, yeah I mean, go ahead. Oh, no, I was saying. I mean, not that this is about Capaldi, but Capaldi also doesn't really have that much of a singular outfit. He seems to change mm-hmm. parts of his costume a lot more, which I do kind of like. But, you know, it, it, everyone, everyone obviously puts their imprint on it. Um, but, yeah, it's weird. I would definitely say that he has catchphrases. Yeah, one of my favorite things about the 12th Doctor it, and, and, you know, Capaldi's performances, I think he's the Doctor that's the least interested in being the Doctor. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's sort of the with Matt Smith, I guess, being the opposite. Like he's sort of the one that's the least interested in his own image and his own mythology. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas Eleven is almost like preoccupied with that at times. But like Apollo's like, whatever, I'm just gonna wear whatever I want. It's just, sometimes it's a hoodie, sometimes it's a weird jacket. I don't really have a catchphrase. I'm just kinda here to just do whatever. Yeah. Well, I think true. that goes back to like the fact that like Eleven is a little kid. Where he's, like, so into doing it. He's so, like, oh, I have to look this way. I have to do this. I have to do this. And then on the flip side of that is um, the side of Eleven where he's, like, so old. So I think the Eleventh Regeneration is more like, I'm a kid, even though he's the oldest the Doctor has ever gotten. So when he gets to 12, 12 is just so old and done with it that he's (laughs) kind of like, I don't care anymore. Like, I'll wear these jeans. And sure, I'll wear a combat boot. Why not? Yeah. I'll play guitar with some sunglasses on. Like, I don't care. And, and it kind of turns into that. And okay. Eleven spends so much time running away from himself, you know, and that's, I think, part of regressing into being a child is that so he's he's been hurt so much that he doesn't want to deal with it anymore. And I, I kind of wonder if, you know, I'm sure we'll find out more, is that he's now gotten to the point where he knows that he can't run away. He can deal with mm-hmm. being an adult more and... and I think a lot of adults, you get to a point where you're like, you know what, I don't care anymore. When I was, you know, younger, I, I had neuroses and I deal with this stuff and I didn't want to confront, you know, reality. But now I've gone past that. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I also am sort I, of... Uh, fast- oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, but I'm sort of piggybacking on that a little off topic, but there's also something interesting about what affects, which I think Moffat has talked about a little bit, this last season of when you regenerate. Is it what you're thinking in your head? Is it the environment and who's around you uh, that subconsciously you are able to affect what your next generation, re- your next regeneration is more than we, the audience had realized. Mm-hmm. And I think well, yeah, if you go back, you can see it. You can see it in there, even in the past with 11, with river, uh, the environment and things that are happening inside and out are affecting the next person that they become. I think. Well, yeah, they do. That's why Eleven is the little whiny kid, because the last thing Ten said was, I don't want to go. Exactly. So they're kind of <laughs> alluded into him being like, I don't want to do this. I don't like in him only doing what he wants. And I have a theory that River, uh, as Alex Kingston, probably looks like what Melody would have looked like at that age, because she was around her parents. She was thinking about her family. Um, they were all there. And and I, 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 I just think that Alex Kingston looks like she could be their kid. <laughs> but that's just me. Um, but I felt like that was the first time I went, oh, well, I think where she was sort of affected how she regenerated. Mm-hmm. Mentally and physically. Yeah. But I, I think about River way too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, that it's kind of like a trend how the doctor before is kind of like influences the like we were just talking about the um the doctor that comes after and like the doctor that comes after is a reaction to the previous doctor right like, absolutely yeah i'm i'm trying to like what what do you guys think matt smith's doctor was a reaction to and david Tennant? does that make sense? sadness that Sa- yeah oh, pain okay. wanting to run away from all that pain and and you know run away from it and but yeah. ignore it and what, mm-hmm. what what better does it but a child yeah, yeah. That's true. yeah. It's 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 ju- it's like denial through joy. I Absolutely, think is yeah. and Eleven's death was sort of. I think if I could, I think the one word to describe Eleven's death was like acceptance. Yep. And totally, um, yeah. And so as a result, the twelfth Doctor was sort of allowed to look as old as as he felt, which is what Deep Breath was all about. Was how he's like finally looks the way that he feels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and you know, and Clara you know, needs to accept that because this is actually the person you're friends with. Uh, he just looked the way he looked before because he was looking for acceptance. And what really, where where he found acceptance finally was actually in himself right before he regenerated. Yeah, and so. it was sort of almost like a meta, you know, where, you know, we, we have this theory that Clara, at least in series seven and kind of eight, is sort of a metaphor for the audience. And Deep Breath was sort of like, you know, will you still love me now that I'm no longer young and beautiful? You know? <laughs> right. Are, are you oh, still going to watch the show? Yeah, are you still going to watch the show even though I'm not cute? <laughs> and there is something really beautiful, I think, of this idea that I think Moffat was sort of setting up, is that 
you know, just because something hurts doesn't mean that it's an experience you need to run away from. That right. you know, yeah. lo- love is something that's beautiful, but love also can break your heart. But better that you experience that love than never have experienced love. Oh yeah, at all. and then, and then there's a line in Beast Below where uh, I think my favorite moment in this episode is when Matt Smith is like, "I yeah, something really bad happened. It was a bad day, but I I but I choose not to forget it because like I can't. I, I'm going to remember beautiful. it." That's one of my favorite parts, along with when um, she asks him if he was a father, and he just, he, he can't answer it. He has to move on. and the, He's, He almost can't emotionally compute. He can't. You know, yeah. yeah. Like, resets. You know, of all of the doctor, the doctor mystery things, like, I don't ever care to meet the doctor's parents. Like, that's not a thing I'm interested in. But we know he has a granddaughter because we've met her. So he must have at least a kid. Yeah. Does it, the doctor's daughter? Techno, kind of. Well, okay, that's <laughs> he not. Doesn't know, that's, he doesn't know she's still alive, but yeah. that's like a weird. And, and who knows if she really is? She could. I mean, <laughs> she she could have went on her first adventure and just immediately was killed. Yeah, I, I mean, we don't, we don't know. She flew oh, right she out of the cannon. She went on to <laughs> marry David Tennant and have yep. babies. <laughs> Third generation. Um, babies. But but yeah, so he he has he must have. Uh, uh, at least a like a kid. I mean, whether whether or not he has you know several kids or or what, but that's the one bit of the doctor's background I don't think I would mind finding more about. I would too. Like I wouldn't mind exploring that. Well, they I mean, said I mean, that he's had kids, but like, he's talked about having kids, so it's just a yeah. matter of like what it's kid a- the granddaughter was. Mm-hmm, right. But I would. De- I definitely got the impression that it was plural that he had more than one child just because of children. Well, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, he's got a he's got a cot. Uh, I know that people are unsure if, if that cot that that they put Melody in is is the doctor's cot or was a child's cot. I don't know why he ran away uh, with his his childhood bed, but uh, that seems to give the impression to me that that there was there was children. I don't know. He happens to mm-hmm. have this, this beautiful thing, Gallifrey, and writing on it. Definitely, yeah. I really like um, the idea of the doctor having like a son, but you you meet him and he's just a total, just a tool. Oh no! <laughs> he's just a complete, just a complete disappointment. <laughs> the he's the master. No, no, no. Be, I, I, I'm picturing just like a loser, just a guy that like said he's never left Gallifrey. He's still in that barn. Yeah, he's just in the, he's still in that barn. Well, and that's that's the thing that I think I find most interesting about the idea of the doctor having children is that he thought that they were dead because he thinks at this point that Gallifrey is gone, and as we learn later, it's not gone, which means his kids are probably there somewhere. And so, yeah. like, I, I it it's so fascinating to me that he has not at least on screen shown any interest in. Seeking them out, he's sort of the ultimate them. absentee father. Yeah, <laughs> they might, which is weird them. because his first companion is his granddaughter. That's the weirdest right. thing. It's like a they Rick might, and Morty situation. Not, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> they might also no, go ahead, have been, um, They might also have been killed in the time war, which is why, like, he might. Oh uh, right, yeah. Right. Just because the plan is there doesn't mean they're still alive. Right, but then he has his normal granddaughter. That's what I don't get. Is, isn't his granddaughter just a like, human? No, no, no. She's, she's Gallifreyan, yeah. but she's she not the Time Lord. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the show. Right. So she doesn't. She doesn't. Uh, she wouldn't be capable of regenerating yet. Right. Uh, because she's not a Time Lord. Ah. Uh, because that's a, not that's <laughs> that's not given to Gallifrey. That's not biological. It's uh, it's a different thing. Like oh, when yeah, you become to, like, a Time Academy Lord and whatever. Right. What when if you get you become a time lord and then they give you the right to regenerate? I what if his children that. opted to not learn the art of regeneration because they just chose to die and the doctor could never like really like come to come to peace with that? Decision. That would be and he just really ran away with his granddaughter. That would be yeah. yeah. But wait, he couldn't deal with it. Then why obviously- did River Song have the ability to regenerate? That's a really was- good question, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because she she was Isn't conceived because- in the vortex? Yeah, but it doesn't, she but was exposed still, to the time vortex. But, but she was conceived oh, right. in she would it. That's the give, big issue. She would have to give the right. Be, I mean, if everyone has the ability to regenerate, but you have to be given the right to regenerate, she still wouldn't be able to regenerate. She would just 
have that capability, but would have to be given the right to regenerate. The doctor yeah. really adopted the time vortex, but River was born in it and molded by it. <laughs> 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 Unseen <laughs> big difference. <laughs> oh. oh my god! <laughs> this is why Vince and the Doctor is my favorite episode because it's just um, can handle. I understand. Uh, <laughs> Great. It could also what? be that uh, it could also be that uh, during that time period when the Silence had her, they gave her the right to the regeneration. Well, so no, what is the it's silence explained. have that capability? <laughs> No, 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 no. Know. But it's, well, because it's just science. <laughs> it's just science. But it's. I, this yeah. I hate the silence. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so dumb. The yeah. weird alien slender man people. I oh, not it. even them. I, I, I hate the religion. I hate when we figure out. I mean, no, well, that's. It's cool, but it just. They cause so many problems in continuity. Yeah. It just yeah, got muddled at that point. Yeah, he kind of stretched it a little too much, I think. But at first, they were really awesome. I thought they were creepy as hell. But that's my first episode. Oh, yeah. That's I mean, my first real episode. So, yeah, the, no, the the the. See, I don't. I, I I hate the confusion in that people call those creatures the silence, but then there's also like the organization, the silence. Yeah, yes. that's when it got weird. And, then, and now suddenly, there's no name to call the Slenderman creatures. No, they are like, they are silence with a T S, and then the organization <laughs> is silence. Oh, nice cast. Oh. No, that's what it is. <laughs> She's like, no, that's what it Seriously? is. <laughs> yeah, because oh they are God. unoriginal. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but so, they do explain that River was, was conceived in the vortex, and that is why she can regenerate. They have the whole, right. you know, and, you know. <laughs> The doctor yeah. pulled out his chalkboard. Like, and also, why also look, <laughs> and, uh, here's the math. Apparently, according to Moffat, when he was on Twitter... Uh, not only was she conceived in the vortex, but on a bunk bed. Yeah. Why? Why is that necessary information? Someone asked. Because he's a troll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he loves and deeply hates his fans. <laughs> uh, I yes. think he. I think he just loves them now. He. I think he went through a phase where he really hated them. No, sure. he still hates us. He gave us the way Clara left. He still hates us because that hurt. It didn't need to hurt. Oh, see, I think he loves us because oh, he gave us season nine. Drama. I love the well, way Clara yeah. left. I thought so it was the I. best companion exit of all time. I love I it, but it, it hurts so much. Like when <laughs> I hear that song, it hurts because you care about her. Like that's that's drama. I it's one of my favorites, and I have to say that it for a while, I loved Clara, but I felt that she overstayed her welcome. And then when that finale Shh. happened, I went, you know what? I'm okay now because then we got this. We didn't get her yeah. anything in the Christmas episode like she was supposed to. This is this right. was good. Yeah, it kind of would have. In retrospect, it kind of would have sucked if her last episode was last Christmas. Yeah, um, because that was such kind of an underwhelming episode. And as much as yeah, she did kind of stay her welcome. I think like uh, I think Hellbent and Heaven Sent are just such oh. iconic episodes of Who. So good. Then, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Then it's like okay, that's the episode that Clara deserves to to go and out. The, on. What's the episode where she is playing? Like it's the red people, I think, and oh, it's the like. Tara? Yeah, no, no, no. That's yeah. eleven. Um, oh, when yes, she literally right. is fighting herself and she's to convince herself not to detonate something. Face oh. the rim? No, it's like no, literally when two the... Jenna Coleman's. One has her hair up, one has her hair down. It's it's, it's and she's in like episode. a white shirt with a black leather jacket. Oh, oh um Scott? The Zygon. I don't one, right? Yes, this is the Zygon. Yeah, the red, yeah, yeah. Oh, the Zygon the red two That's the fiftieth. Oh, um, that was Saigon two parter. Yeah, that one oh, yeah. was really good. And wasn't this that la this last season? Oh, yeah. recently. Yeah. Yes, that was very good, and it felt very timely. What I really liked about which something that I got from this episode, having seen it, having not seen it in a while, is that it felt very timely. And what I liked about that was it was using I felt things that were happening in the news and sort of showing it in a different way. You know, when you you take out the emotional quality of uh, well, not quality, but the connection to something when it's political like this, uh, by not making it you know terrorists, <laughs> but making it mm -hmm. these alien creatures, I think that it it gets into people's brains more about like, hey, this is what we're trying to say is happening because you're taking out this emotional center that maybe is making someone you know not pay attention because they're on this side or that side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
so one of the things uh, the Beast Below does really well that is also uh, a Moffat staple that I I like a lot um, is that Moffat Moffat is the kind of writer who and there there aren't many like him uh, but and I'm always really jealous of the writers who can do this but it's that. He can see something really simple, like right in front of him, and turn it into like this crazy story idea. Uh, you know, like with this, it, I don't know what you would call that. If you call it like big, big ideas with simple execution, or simple ideas with big execution, or sure. I don't know what you would call that. But the idea of like, oh, you know, like like the silence where it's like, oh, you can't remember them when you're not looking at them. Like that's such a simple idea. Mm-hmm. And it makes for a cool creature or the, the angels. It's you sort know, of that like, same gift that Stan Lee had where you can just be like, what if there was this hero that could crawl on a wall? And then it's the greatest thing that ever happened. To it's, yeah, it's really, it's really simple stuff. And uh, so I really like the idea here, which is that what if, what if you found yourself in a room with no memory of how you got there and a video of yourself played saying that you chose to, to forget something? Yeah, or, or even like you know the 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 catalyst of this episode is like the one thing that's out of place is a child crying, you know, like that that's such a simple, it you know it does so much by saying so little it establishes like the doctor's mm-hmm. character and and uh, Amy's character and like this world and like yeah and then it, it's um yeah he gosh he can he can be such a good writer yeah and then at the same time he sets up that it if a child is crying the doctor will come. And then he kicked a child out of the TARDIS as 12. Sure. Oh. <laughs> so he completely diminishes great points he makes. Like, two, like I oh, love Moffat. He does. He does my change. friend pointed that out to me. She's like, he set this up and then two, like the next season with, or not the next season, the next doctor. He's like, LOL, I don't like kids anymore. <laughs> like, All right, great. But here's the thing about 12. I do think that a lot of that is bravado and him sort of, you know, protecting his own heart. And I don't mm-hmm. think that he is as curmudgeon and hateful of people as he pretends oh, yeah. to be. I mean, like the, the, the there was that beautiful moment in, uh, in listen where he like helps that where he, you know, he tells that little boy that fear is a superpower, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's actually interesting to go back to what we're talking about too, is while well, watching this episode, episodes like this remind me how at its core, this is meant to be, I don't want to say a children's show, but geared towards children. And I think a family Ma- show, yeah, it's family. family show. There you go. Family show. Um, is that Moffat thinks about that and that there was a big deal made about that fear is a superpower because it was great for children to hear that uh, mm-hmm. in the same way that um, Inside Out has helped a lot of kids with their emotions and understanding that it's okay to be angry and it's okay to be sad. Is um, And I could be wrong, and I am a big Moffat fan and I have read a lot of things, but it may all be merging in my head, is this idea of, well, what's going to scare a kid? What's going to be something that you would be... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, adverse to like the shadows under your bed or um, mm-hmm. clowns or uh, exactly being in a room and that would happen. Uh, in fact, I've heard him say that um, when people have said, well, why is the season starting so late or why is this happening? I mean, back when we didn't have to wait a whole year, he said, well, oh, there's just something about watching Doctor Who in the fall when the sun yeah. sets uh, a little bit sooner and it's dark out and you're watching the show in the dark. And I it's think colder. That that's a- colder. Mm. There you go. I think that's something that he really is actually a keen of, particularly that he, he was a fan since he was a small child as well. And I think I just think that that's something he does think of when he thinks of his ideas. Mm-hmm. And even uh, even newer uh, traditions like now, it, it's almost impossible to think of a, a Christmas Day ending without a new episode of Doctor Who. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. My that's like one of my favorite pastimes is which one of. My, like me or my brother, like which one of us can download Doctor Who fast enough to watch it on Christmas together? Well, now that it airs in the U.S., we just like make sure we're home at my grandma's to watch it together. Oh yeah, and and you know to get a little bit, uh, you know, we, we you know we were talking about uh, how this was sort of a, a a seminal episode for for Lauren and Rachel. Um, the Eleventh Doctor, this this era of the show, kind of means a lot to me emotionally because um, for the first. You know, from Eccleston to the end of Tenet, I, I watched this show sort of in a vacuum because um, I was like this kid growing up in Texas in like the mid 2000s. And, you know, you couldn't get Doctor Who stuff at like Barnes and Noble. You know, I, I watched the show 
by myself. I thought about it by myself. And I, I was literally the only kid in my high school that knew what Doctor Who was. And um, so then in the fall of 2010, when I when I started college, I, I went to school for acting and was surrounded by a bunch of, you know, Anglophile acting nerds. And, um, and they loved Doctor Who. And so this was kind of the first time, you know, the Beast Below and and, and, you know, the victory of the Daleks and this whole thing was the first time I ever watched this, the show socially and would talk about it and had friends that would like dress up like 11 and whatnot. And, and so watching this episode kind of reminded me of kind of when the show stopped being my thing and started being a thing that belonged to me and my friends. And so, yeah, it was it, it was really nice watching this episode again, and I I got a lot of nostalgia out of it. And yeah, well, it's I like completely agree because it's weird when you go from watching it and not talking to anyone. Like, I talked to my brother, and that was it. Yeah. To I went. I think my like junior year of college, I dressed up like the TARDIS. Like I had this blue dress, and I used tape and taped a TARDIS on it, and made like a hat that was the light. And I walked outside and it was so weird because all of these people were like, oh my God, I love the TARDIS dress. And they like knew what it was. And from going to like sitting with and calling my brother being like, did you watch this episode? Because that's the only person I could talk to about it to walking down the street as the TARDIS and all of these people stopping me and telling me how cool it was. It was, it was like mind blowing. Yeah. Or like meeting kids that were like, that loved it so much they would dress up as it. Whereas, you know, in high school it was like, you like Doctor Who? No. What are you talking about? Oh my God. How did you know yeah. who told you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this era uh, is important to, you know, this, this podcast. Cause th- that's when we started this podcast was oh, yeah. uh, to launch the, the Moffat era. And, and so I have a lot of fond memories, especially of this season, because this was the, the only season that I covered with uh, Randy McKinney, the original uh, co-host who, uh, he, he passed away a few years ago of, uh, brain cancer. And so when I think of these, this season, I do specifically think of the early days of this podcast and recording it with Randy. And so, yeah, I mean, this, this season means a lot, uh, to me, uh, and this era means a lot to me, even if, you know, it definitely does go off the rails. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It, um, it it's still yeah I mean it just yeah I've got I've got a really uh, it's got a real soft spot in my heart. Randy McKinney, the uh, the namesake for uh, the city and that our show takes place in Geek by Night. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Really? Yeah. That, yeah. That, that's I why never it's called, put that together. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's why it's called McKinney oh. City. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it's, oh, that's nice. <clears throat> um, but uh, yeah, so I I just I really love uh the Beast Below. I think it is. Sort of everything that I think Moffat, when he talks about when he talked about series five when it was going on, and he he would make all of those uh, sort of like thematic uh, points, saying like, "Oh, I want it to feel like a fairy tale." Oh, you're I think, going to love it. It's a fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> I think because I think most of that went away with uh, after after series five. I think that was a specifically a series five kind of tone. And that became a nightmare. Yeah, well, I mean, well, I mean the doctor. Yeah, right. Um, and so, so like, I think, I think the fairy tale thing is very specific to series five, and I think no other story of series five. It's like this and Vincent and the Doctor. I think, I think are the two stories this season that really feel like the fairy tale that we were promised, yeah, or like, or like a children's story that you loved when you were a kid, and mm-hmm. now you can. You know, you, you you can read the Chronicles of Narnia or Harry Potter as an adult now and find, you know, it's still that, that loveliness of when you were a kid. But now there's even more to it because you're older and you've been hurt. Mm-hmm. Well, I yeah, I really yeah. like. Oh, um, I, I don't I, I really like this because it's so quiet in comparison to the 11th hour. Um, mm-hmm. And it's interesting that I had no idea that he wrote it after uh, the Angel two-parter because I I really think that this is an underrated episode and it's mm-hmm. so yes. quintessentially Moffat, but like the quieter Moffat, not like the big explosion, like Michael Bay kind of thing. Um, and I don't know, this episode, every time I watch it, just makes me cry. Um, 
because mm-hmm. it's so it feels just so quintessentially Doctor Who as well. And like when Moffat is on, he is on and he like knows how to tap in to what makes this show tick. And like at its heart, it's, you know, this this old being who's kind and just travels the world. And it just I don't know. It just makes me so emotional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just everything with the with the with the with the fail whale. <laughs> the fail whale. The the fail whale. whale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a, that, that's his new nickname. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh that's Fail whale. Isn't, isn't that isn't it enough that he's constantly tortured on a daily basis? I haven't heard fail whale in so long. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, and it, it, yeah, it's such a beautiful idea, and I, I I think it really speaks to Moffat's kind of vision of this universe. I mean, we we talked about kind of how um, New Earth or the end of the world sort of is kind of really optimistic in a way that that's kind of quintessentially who you know, mm-hmm. like there's sort of you know there sort of is no post-apocalypse in the doctor who universe because humanity will always find a way to like keep going and get better and keep mm-hmm. making mistakes you know it's, it's like failing upwards which i really mm-hmm. love and, and I think this also is how, oh sorry go ahead <laughs> uh and i think just just how uh we are better together than by ourselves i mean there's so many stories about how the doctor needs someone with him so that he doesn't make bad choices that you know it's only mm-hmm. that you're stronger together than apart and humanity yeah, and, seems to just we don't need earth we we just need each other yeah and even even liz 10 i mean she's been sort of letting herself make the same mistake for hundreds of years and it isn't until these other people from outside can come in and be like no you don't you don't have to do it this way you know yeah yeah i i think uh i i think what I like about this, especially in comparison to New Earth, because I think they're both optimistic stories. But what's interesting is that New Earth is optimistic in that, you know, it has a, you know, we can save everyone sort of ending. Uh, that's that's really, you know, beautiful and optimistic. But then this story is actually coming from a cynical place. And it's mm-hmm. saying that we're going to we're, we we can we can do terrible things for the greater good, you know, and then in the end come out of the cynicism, like the idea that we as a, as a, as a species, as, as humans, like we can make mistakes and we can learn from them and move on from them. Yeah. I mean, we can make, I mean, kind of an un, unbearably kind of un, un, unspeakable mistake, you know, right. like the worst mistake ever, you know, we've been torturing this, <laughs> innocent beautiful creature for hundreds of years and even then we are we are never beyond redemption we are never past the point of no return Mm -hmm. i think i think the saddest part of this story is is that moment where after we've discovered what they've done to the to the space whale (laughs) to the to, to the star whale and and that and the doctor lets everyone hear his his screams of agony and then after we hear that the the kid walks up to the thing and it starts playing with yeah, the kid oh and I'm God. like that thing is screaming in agony and it still can't help but play with this child. Ugh, yeah, kills me. Makes me cry so hard because it's yeah. the doctor. Yeah, he comes yeah. to save and he <laughs> plays with the children. Yeah, and you know I think that was yeah. something that I always got from it. I I don't know why it didn't resonate me the first time I saw it. it it could also be that I was so knee deep in the middle of season six that um, I was comparing it to something or I was in a different state. But seeing it now, for some reason, it also resonated with me because it feels like what's happening in our society today with this election cycle, <laughs> with uh, mm-hmm. sort of the, the fracturing of, of humanity that is sort of happening. And it, it had a whole other sense to me that I don't think or maybe I'm just older, I don't know, but there was so much social resonance for today that had a larger effect on me, and I went from being, ah, I don't really like that episode, and ne- having not rewatched it since, and now just really loving it, and loving what it's saying. Totally, and like, you know, like, in, we, in the year where we have seen sort of the rise, a very kind of alarming rise in, like, nationalism and, and, and isolationism, and like, no, we are actually not a country that takes in immigrants and refugees we will only look after ourselves we will only take care of ourselves i mean both america and britain um i mean britain kind of uh, drew you know fired the first shot so to speak and 
<laughs> well, we'll see how we do in November. But um, and it's interesting seeing our generation that kind of grew up with you know these stories of different people coming together, whether it's Harry Potter, whether it's Doctor Who, whether it's uh, the Lord of the Rings, and it's you know I read this this thing where um, it was like on the news where. Uh, millennials that grew up reading Harry Potter are less likely to support Donald Trump. And um, I think that's just because these stories kind of do have an effect on us. And, you know, they're not just, you know, it's not just opiate for the masses. You know, we, mm-hmm. we if it's done well, and I I would love for, uh, for, for Moffat to actually just write a children's book. Um, oh, he'd be great at it. Yeah. Well, yeah I, 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 the movie Tintin, right? Which I haven't yeah. seen, so I can't say. But. Oh, it's so oh, good. so good. <laughs> um, you yeah. said that, and this is slightly off topic, but it rounds out your point nicely. Um, sure. I met Helena Bonham Carter one time on the street. And oh, wow. as I was leaving, I said to her, I was like, I would be like remiss if I didn't say. I was like, I'm a Harry Potter kid, so thank you. And she goes, the one thing that the book series did for your generation was make you some of the most educated people I've ever spoken to. And I was huh. like, and it's true. That's why we don't vote Donald Trump. <laughs> we're the most educated people. <laughs> but no, it was like, it's it's that. Like, these stories educate us and they teach us. And so our generation is very informed. And I think that's why millennials have such a bad rap. Because they view us as being like, oh, well, you guys think you know everything, but you don't. It's like, no, we're just more informed because we want to know things. And these stories are kind of what like make us want, that we want to learn everything we can about situations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now we have Definitely. to tell equally better, if not better stories for the next generation. And you're Very so true. impressionable <laughs> at, the, at that age that whether you realize it or not, it's forming your, who you are as a person and the decisions that you're going to make. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, closing <laughs> thoughts on, uh, on, on the beast below. Uh, we'll start with Cass. Um, one thing that I thought was really funny, um, cause I've seen this many, many times. Um, it's also kind of my comfort episode, even though it makes me cry like a baby every time. Um, <laughs> the last time I watched through the Matt Smith era, I was like, man, Amy is really like irresponsible. Like why would she be running away and blah, blah, blah. But now that I'm getting married in like less than like two months, <laughs> I completely understand why. And I'd be like, yeah, I'd be there in a heartbeat. I'd be in space right now instead of dealing with all of this. Um, no <laughs> Um, I could just picture poor Norman in the background. <laughs> what? Uh, what was that about? Oh, wait, um, what did you say? <laughs> he's like, what? Do I got to watch out for people in blue boxes now? Um, no, but I. it's interesting, like, coming back to this, being a little older and, like, seeing all of Matt Smith. Um, uh, <laughs> all and just, of Matt Smith. Yeah, all of Matt Smith. <laughs> Wow. Remember Craig? Certain, Remember the Craig episode? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I really love this, and it's it's so. I really do think it's one of Moffat's great stories, and it's super super underrated. Hmm. Uh, what about you, Nick? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm really gonna miss this era of the show. I mean, as we, uh, you know, like the like the Jaeger pilots in Pacific Rim. You know, we're about to reset the clock. <laughs> and go all the way back to Hartnell again. I'm I'm really gonna miss. Yeah, I I, I I'm, I'm remembering this era of the show more and more fondly with age. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm excited mm-hmm. to come back to it in a few freaking months. <laughs> uh, Lauren, uh, something that I think, I mean, impressed me, but I, it wasn't like I was surprised. Was I knew that they were filmed out of order. Uh, so I decided after I watched uh, the episode to kind of go watch them in the order that they filmed them and sort of get a sense like, oh, did it take him a while to get into the character? Um, was this just a way for him to sort of ease his way into the 11th Doctor? And it wasn't true. Everything f- was so strong. The, from the first episodes they filmed to the first episodes that we saw. And I don't know, and maybe it made me miss Matt Smith more than I had been. Maybe I was in denial. Um, but it really made me sort of appreciate, I think, like Cass said, sort of the arc of it, seeing, you know, now I can see where everything went. And, uh, and then also, uh, I had noticed that there were a couple of Star Wars references, <laughs> which oh, made, yeah. made me laugh. I, the, the, the bit where they're, they're in uh, the Beast and they're on the tongue, I mean, that's, 
They talk about being in a garbage compactor, and it's yeah. just like it's, <laughs> it's, it's totally like a combination New Hope and Empire Strikes Back reference. Like it's so weird. And but the Force Awakens. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It, it, but also predicted the Force Awakens. Uh, Ten says you're my only hope to the Doctor. That was the big thing for me at first. I was like, I don't remember this because the. When they're on the tongue, I feel like that's a scene that's in a lot of trailers, and you remember that, and it's a big scene. But, um, but mm-hmm. Liz t- says to the doctor that he's their only hope. Oh, right, uh, that yeah. too. That's yeah. right. Oh, and Sophie Okonedo is. I, I, I still oh, can't believe that they got her for this episode. I mean, I, I know it's a fun role, but like this is an Academy Award winning actress. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, she's great. I, w- I wish she, I wish she came back. I wish we yeah, saw it was me that. too. Well, she came. She came back she come one back. more in the yeah. finale. Well, yeah, that was very briefly. Yeah, it was brief, definitely. Um, uh, Rachel, um, I just I like the Beast Blow because it shows why Eleven is my favorite Doctor because he's very flawed. Where like mm-hmm. Tennant was kind of he flipped out occasionally, but he was normally like fun. He cried like very few times, but he was always like this nice, composed Doctor. And Nine was kind of, like, mean, and you knew he was mean, but he had, like, his soft spot for Rose, where Eleven is, like, so all over the place that, like, you never know what you're going to get with him, and he's a loose cannon, and that's what I really love about Eleven. And the Beast Blow is what really kind of showed you what you were going to get with him. And I really, I just, I love this episode because it gave me that, and it gave me gotcha with Amy and the Doctor at the end. And that's that how beautiful that shot is. And the two of them standing together it just kind of defined their relationship a little bit. And I really just love that moment. And the uh, the chemistry of, of Karen Gillan and Matt Smith that kind mm-hmm. of married the show for three years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, yeah. No. So, uh, so I guess that, that about wraps us up. Um, why don't you guys uh, – I'm sure you guys have a lot of stuff to plug. Why don't you, uh, why don't you give us some plugs? Uh, Lauren, you go first. Okay. Uh, well, we obviously together host the Fordcast, the Harrison Ford podcast, which you can find on iTunes and Google Play and wherever you listen to uh, podcasts. But I also write a column on forcesofgeek.com. It's a pop culture column. Uh, I'll be writing a lot about time travel just because I love time travel. But uh, once a month, I just sort of write about uh, pop culture type things. And I'm sure I will be talking about Doctor Who a lot. <laughs> Um, but that's only that's the recent things to plug. You can follow us on Twitter, Lauren Milberger, on my website, and things like that. Rachel, um, I also have a podcast called Hard Bodies, where we objectify men. Um, <laughs> nice, that's we awesome. Just, <laughs> we just pick a hot actor, we pick a movie we think they're hot in, and we talk about their bodies. A lot of time we like <laughs> talk about the movie, but we like talk about their body. Um, I uh, you, so. <laughs> Search hard bodies, you'll find it. Um, you can follow my Twitter. Maybe, 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 search, maybe, search, maybe search hard bodies podcast. <laughs> yeah, sorry, not like iTunes. Search hard bodies. Don't just search for hard bodies. Uh, search yeah, I made hard that bodies mistake. podcast. Um, was Twitter, it a mistake though? I mean, no, it was not. It was a great <laughs> Sir, I'm at Rachel Leishman on Twitter. Uh, I also write for the Culturist. Um, I write a lot about Chris Pine. Sorry, guys. Um, and yeah, I also have like a live stream I do with my friend, but that's just on Tumblr. Oh, have you seen Hell or High Water yet? Oh, it is incredible. I, I saw it twice. It. It's so good. I love she Jeff Bridges. On the show. I love Chris Pine, and it's like that was an that was everything to me because it was both of them. Yeah, and Chris Pine was like. Dirty, gross, hot the entire time, and I was totally into it. It was great. That was uh, that was actually the original title, uh, Dirty, Dirty, Gross, Hot. hot. And I would have paid good money to be in that movie. Uh, all right. Well, uh, we will be back in a few weeks uh, as we uh, reset and go back to the beginning uh, with Hartnell. We'll be talking about the third story of Every Doctor, uh, starting with the first Doctor and the Daleks, the introduction yes. of the Daleks. Yes.